Well, I think despite myself, I have been quite getting quite into the Olympics. And I say despite myself, because if I'm honest, after the Euros and with everything else in life going on at the moment, I'm not sure, I didn't feel like I had the energy for it. But I have found myself getting quite keen on all these, well, at the moment, it's all the slightly random sports, isn't it? Which, you know, you never really hear much about. And then suddenly we win Olympic golds in them. And it gets very exciting. And I was watching uh, how Charlotte Worthington won a gold in the BMX. And if you get a chance, go on the BBC website and watch the highlights of her gold ring attempt. Because, I mean, some of the leaps and jumps that are going on with that bike are amazing. I mean, I, my, my normal bike ride is good quality if I don't fall off it, let alone if I do a 360 backward flip or whatever they were doing. Um, it was very, it was incredible, really. Uh, and um, one of the things I was particularly struck by with her performance is you get two runs at it, and her first run was a total disaster. Uh, she set off, and after about one jump, fell off the bike. Looked like she was sprawling all over the place, uh, and that was the end of that run. But she picked herself back up and went for it the second time round and surprised everyone and got the gold medal. She performed incredibly well. And of course, for Olympic athletes, that practice is so important to uh, producing a good performance. But equally important, if not more so for them, is their belief. The belief and the belief that they have been given that they can do it. The belief that they have a chance to be the best in the world. That is what drives them in their practice. That's what picks them up when they fall down and feel they can't go on. And that coming together of faith and practice and hard work is something that gets picked up a little bit in our readings today. Over the last three weeks, we've been tracking the story of that fabulous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. Two weeks ago, Sophie had the bookends of that story. Last week, Ian uh, got to preach on the miracle itself. And this Sunday, our reading picks up from the second part of the miracle in John's Gospel, the explanation of why it happened and what might be going on there. And the crowd who have been fed by Jesus uh, are waiting for him and expecting to see him come back on a boat across the lake. They can't find him anywhere on their side. And when they can't see him or when he doesn't come back in the boat, they realize that somehow he has gone over to the other side of the lake and they make their way round there. And after that journey round, they encounter Jesus and they demand to know if he is the Messiah. There was a really strong belief in uh, Judaism at the time of Jesus that the Messiah would give manna from heaven in the same way that Moses did. It was one of the proofs they were looking for that someone was the Messiah. And so when, when the crowd have this conversation with Jesus about the bread from heaven, the manna from heaven, what they're searching for and longing for behind that is proof that Jesus is the Messiah. They want him to perform in, an, in a certain way for them, to prove that he is, uh, they are, that he is justified in being the object of their belief. And so in Jesus' normal way, particularly in the Gospel of John, as John retells the story, Jesus gets asked a question and completely ignores the question in his response. Uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's a funny pattern when you read these sort of conversations, particularly in John's Gospel. Jesus never quite responds to the question that's asked. He responds to the question that should have been asked. Uh, and gives the answer that is needed. And so he tells them not to long after bread, but long after eternal life. And in verse 28, they say to Jesus, what must we do to perform the works of God? What must we do to perform the works of God? Performance is probably something we all fall a bit guilty of in life and in our Christian lives, I think. Performance is something which demands us to put a face on when things are going badly, which calls us to uh, look holier, perhaps, than we are, 
which says to us, you can't possibly share any of those doubts or those fears with Christian brothers and sisters. Or in the wider world, maybe you're feeling that the world is collapsing around you and yet still putting on a brave face, we call it, don't we? So carrying on regardless, having a stiff upper lip, whatever it might be. We're quite good in this country of just pushing on through and pretending that everything is okay. Performing can be a very damaging thing for us in life and in our faith. And it's wonderful, I think, to see and hear much more of in the news about the, uh, the hidden pandemic of mental health, which is so challenging, particularly for younger people these days. It's great that the vulnerability and the, a, the space to talk about that openly and honestly is being made in wider society. But in our Christian lives, we also fall victim to performing. We fall victim to the idea that we can somehow keep things hidden from God. Frank Skinner, uh, who's a very devout Catholic, um, has written a great book, a comedian's prayer book, worth reading uh, if you get a chance to do it. Uh, and in it, he talks very openly and honestly about prayer. And he says that for him, the, the most important thing about prayer is that it is probably the only place where he can be completely honest completely honest with himself, completely honest with God. Prayer is the only place where performance is stripped away, where we can rest in the honesty of God and God's love for us. You see, in prayer, the layers of pretense that we build up around ourselves are stripped away. It's why, if I'm honest, silence is such an important form of prayer and part of prayer life. I don't know about you, but often when I come to approach God in prayer, I have my list of things to say sorry for, I have my list of things I'd like God to do, and then there's probably a little bit of space at the end where I just sort of say, oh, well, uh, you know, God, I'm running out of time a bit now, but if, if you'd like to say anything to me, please, please do that. Anything, anything, nothing, great. Okay, we're all on the same page, off we go, the day continues. When you come to God in silence, you don't bring that list of things you failed on. You don't bring that list of things you want God to do. You come and you sit in a place with God where you literally offer nothing apart from the fact that you are there. And where in that place, God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy works deeply and powerfully. Prayer is a place where we can be completely honest with God, with ourselves. I know I've said this before, but how often do we fall into the misguided belief that we can hide things from God when God has no illusions about us at all? Before we were born, God knew us. God knew when we would fall down and need picking up. God knew the great things that we would do. God knew the things we would want to hide from other people. And God still says to us those same words that God spoke to Christ at his baptism. I love you. You are my child. I am so proud of you. In that space of prayer, of resting in God's presence, pretense and performance are stripped away. Love and grace can be found more deeply and are offered freely for each of us. Jesus' reply to the question about performing in verse 28 is pretty straightforward. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. It's not the work of God that we exhaust ourselves doing lots of good things, as worthy as that is. It is the work of God that we believe in Jesus Christ that we make our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God our focus in our life, that we make it our reason for getting up in the morning and rejoicing, that we make it the thing that holds us when we fall down and fail. Our belief in Jesus Christ, that is the work of God. 
And if that is the work of God to bring about belief in Jesus Christ as a son of God, then surely, surely that is our work as church and as Christians. Wherever we find ourselves, our work, our calling is to help people believe in Jesus Christ. But of course, the challenge with that is that how we live out our lives reveals the integrity of our belief. And Paul alludes to this in Ephesians. Ephesians makes clear that the outworkings of our faith should be those works of love and hope, those words that lift up and support the vulnerable and the poorest, those words that encourage and support each other. How we live together as Christians reveals the depth and the integrity and the value of our belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You know, what you find in all the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostle as well, is whenever you read about a miracle, the miracle is never the point. The miracle points people to God. And perhaps that's never clearer than in John's Gospel, where the miracles that Jesus does always lead on to Jesus saying something about who he is. And here in this retelling of the feeding of 5,000, Jesus reveals that he is the bread of life. The miracles are never the point. The works are never the point. They point to Jesus as the Son of God. If you ever get a chance to read the book of James, now I am slightly biased, but it is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Um, I would encourage you to read it not as a book that is written, but as a sermon that is preached. Um, I think the book of James was probably a sermon which was written down. And actually, if you do that, it changes, I think, the way that book is read. Because it can come across as very challenging, and no more so than when it comes to this interplay between belief and good works. James 2.23 says, Faith was active, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Our belief in Jesus Christ is that central thing which drives us and guides us, but the outworking of that in our lives reveals the value of who Christ is. If we say to people, we believe in Jesus Christ who will transform all things, who offers freely the gift of salvation and love, and then they look at our lives and they see that in most areas of it, we don't bother to involve Jesus at all. Does that point to integrity of what we say about our belief in Jesus? I don't think it does. In 1 John 2, 6, John says, whoever says I abide in him, in Jesus, ought to walk just as he walked. Paul exhorts us to live lives worthy of the calling to which we have been called, that of making faith in Christ known, that of drawing people to faith in Christ. But we do that and we give witness and testimony to that belief through, through our words and our deeds. And in Ephesians, Paul lists there, doesn't he, those wonderful ministries of the church. And he says the purpose of these is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You see, all of us have a work of ministry. Wherever we find ourselves during the week, in homes, in colleges, in schools, in workplaces, amongst our community, with strangers, with friends, with family, with the poorest and the most vulnerable, all of us have a work of ministry. Whether we work in the church, whether we are in healthcare, whether we are at home, whether we're in education, the creative arts, wherever we might find ourselves, even politics, all of us have a work of ministry. That through our words and our deeds, our lives and our actions, we point people and draw people to Jesus Christ. That we reveal our belief in Christ as the Son of God. We are part of the same body of Christ, as Paul says, one Lord, one faith, 
one baptism. We are church not just when we meet together like this on Sundays. We are church as we go out in the week and find ourselves in so many different places. And I know that for some of you, you may find yourself as the only Christian in those places. What a calling is that, to witness to the good news of Christ in work, in home, in schools and colleges, and in our community. That idea of the church as the body of Christ, building and equipping each other to do the ministry of God, is such a foundational belief for Paul. It is such a foundational belief for Christians throughout the world and throughout history that we are the body of Christ together. But we may want to echo the words of St. Jude, bless St. Jude. I mean, he gets one line in the Bible. Um, and to be fair, he asks a question which most of us want to ask. He says to Jesus, but Lord, why us? Uh, and if we're honest, there are moments in our life when we want to turn around, either as individual Christians or as the church, and say, Lord, why on earth did you choose this way of making yourself known to the world? But of course, that is the wrong question. We are not called to focus on our own failings and weaknesses, for those not called to focus on those moments when we get it wrong and make mistakes. We are called instead in those moments to refocus and rediscover the love and the grace of Jesus Christ anew. And from that place, from that space, to continue to witness to the good news of Christ. Indeed, if you, when you read uh, that passage from Ephesians, you can see that Paul is envisaging the church as a group of faithful Christians seeking after God who are growing in their faith. Paul, being ever the realist, lists those qualities, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Those are hardly qualities you need to list if people aren't falling out with each other and things aren't a bit difficult and tricky. We are not meant yet to be the perfect body of Christ, but we are meant to be a body that is seeking to grow up in every way into, who, into him who is the head, into Christ. Much like Charlotte Worthington, when she fell down, she didn't give up. Instead, she got up and went for that gold medal winning run. So where do we begin with that? With all of that, with our call to be witnesses to the good news of Christ wherever we find ourselves, for our shared ministry, for the challenge of our words and our deeds revealing our faith in Christ, and at the heart of it, to focus our lives around believing and pursuing Christ. Where do we begin with all of that? Well, I think I would be encouraging us to begin in that place of prayer to make time in our lives, however that is carved out, to simply sit with God, to be honest with God, to allow, ourself, to allow us to be honest with ourselves. And that may involve silence, it may be walking, it may be uh, on a cycle ride, it may be sitting with some liturgical aids like morning prayer or many of the other Celtic prayer aids that are out there. It may be putting on a piece of music so loud that it drowns out everything else and just hearing what God says to you in that. We begin where we end in our Christian life, in prayer, in resting in God's presence. And from there, the Spirit will work, the Spirit will work in each of us to help us in our words and our actions to grow more Christ-like to witness in all that we are, wherever we find ourselves. At the end of our service today, we'll do what we've been doing since we came back into the church on Easter Day. We'll be going outside to sing our final hymn. I love that moment for us as church. We go outside together, some with good voices, some of us with not quite so good voices, some people playing particular roles, 
standing at the front and leading. Other people were hanging around the edges, making sure the passers-by are being talked to. Some people were handing out hymn sheets. Together we stand in the midst of our community, and because of our belief, belief in Christ, we worship God. And as we worship God, we make Christ known. It's a picture of us all going out, wherever we find ourselves this week and beyond. We all have our roles and our spaces. We will all, in our deeds and our actions, witness to the good news of Christ. And at the heart of it all will be our shared belief and faith in Jesus as the Son of God and that call from Christ to make him known. So wherever we find ourselves this week, may our voices in our words and our actions ring out loud and clear in worship and in praise. And may we together proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen.